I like the most, this is just uh, an introduction before I get into the simile proper, is that you know that a lotus, when water drops on the lotus, it just runs off, leaving no residue. So I ask each one of you, if you're a Buddhist, to practice like a lotus. If people urinate on you, <laughs> that urine just leaves you without any smell, without any residue. Or if people put perfume on you, it just falls off without leaving any scent. Because the lotus keeps nothing. And in that <coughs> sorry, it means if people criticize you, <coughs> if they scold you, if they say bad things about you, that's like urinating on the lotus. Does a lotus keep anything? No. The urine just falls off and it leaves no scent or fragrance at all, no residue. Afterwards, the lotus just smells like a lotus. But if somebody calls you a pig or a dog, does it leave a residue? My goodness, it does. <laughs> you don't let it go. So when people call you bad names, or they scold you, or they criticize you, remember to be like a lotus. It just runs off you and leaves no residue. Or pouring perfume over the lotus is when people praise you. Ajahn Brahm, you're such a wonderful monk. You're the greatest monk in the whole of Serpentine. <laughs> <laughs> or wherever. Then you let that just roll off you. So you're still the same person after the praise. You praise or blame, may it leave no residue. So if your wife is scolding you, remember, must be like a lotus, be like a lotus, be like a lotus. <laughs> so you never get angry. And if your husband prays you, darling, you're the most beautiful girl in the whole world, I'm so lucky to have married you, like a lotus, then it all went off you. <laughs> so that's one of the nice similes of the lotus. Whatever goes on top of it, it leaves no residue. But the simile of the thousand petal lotus is a great simile of meditation. And it explains why there is that famous Tibetan mantra, the Om Mani Padmi Hum mantra. It's not Tibetan, it's Sanskrit, and Sanskrit is so close to Pali, actually the Pali and the Sanskrit are the same in that particular case. The Om and the Hum is the same as the Nam Mo we do in our chanting, it just means like uh, with reverence, praise, uh, a term of respect to what happens afterwards. So Namo Tassa Bhagwato means, Namo means like praise or homage to the Buddha. <coughs> so the Om and the Hum at the end is just praise uh, to what goes on in between. And what goes on in between are the two words Mani and Padmi. And Mani means a jewel, Padmi means in the lotus, There's some Sri Lankans, they, girls are called Padma, that's what that word means, it's in the lotus. So what that phrase means is homage or worship, the jewel in the lotus. And now I'm going to explain what that jewel in the lotus is. Because, as you all know, the lotuses, they close up at night time. And in the early morning, before the sun has come up, the first light of dawn, if you look at that lotus in the lake, it's fully closed. And on the outside, that outside leaf is always rough. It's coarse, it's not beautiful, it has no fragrance. Because the outside leaf or petal has to withstand all the wind and the dust to protect the petals inside. So the outside is not very promising. But when the first light of the sun comes, it warms that lotus, gives it light, and so the outermost petals can open up. And inside the outermost petals, you get the next layer of petals, which are still a bit uh, rough and coarse and thick. But at least they start to become beautiful and fragrant. 
And when they receive the warmth and the light of the sun, they too open up to see the next layer of petals. And the third layer is within the second layer. The fourth is within the third. As you go deeper and deeper and deeper into the lotus, you know the next layer of petals is right inside the layer of petals you can see right now. And as long as the warmth and the light of the sun sustain themselves, in other words, a cloud doesn't come and block out the sun, it means that the lotus will open up and continue opening. And the deeper you go into that lotus, the more beautiful are the petals, the more fragrant is the scent, and even the thinner and more subtle are those petals. And that is the simile of what meditation is. The warmth and the light of the sun stand for compassion and mindfulness. And when compassion, the warmth, mindfulness, the light shine on this thing we call a body and mind without moving, you open up as you go deeper and deeper into yourself. And that is a path of meditation. So how that works in practice, you sit here, you close your eyes, <coughs> and with kindness and mindfulness to your body, you can relax everything. This was the first instruction which I gave to you. If you can't relax your body, the body will always be there as an obstacle. You can't get inside of it. You're always on the outside, <coughs> worrying about aches and pains, irritations or whatever. And I'm sure that many of you have found already that you can sit down and after a while you can totally forget your body. It's like it doesn't exist anymore. It tends to disappear. You're sitting here watching your breath or whatever else you're watching and the body's nice and comfortable so it doesn't grab your attention. You've got inside the body. Now it's important with that simile, the warmth and the light of the sun. The light is a mindfulness, but without the warmth it doesn't open up. So don't just be mindful. You have to be mindful and kind. Those two are really important. And in some traditions they emphasize mindfulness, but there's no kindness at all. Be mindful! And in some traditions they even come up behind you with a stick. And if they see you nodding, whack! Is that compassion? No. But you know it does work. Because <laughs> well, sort of, not really. Because I remember that when I was a student, there weren't many places I could meditate, you know, in a place like England. It was my bad karma. I must have done some very bad karma in my past life to be, get reborn as an Ang Mo. <laughs> but I made up for it now. <laughs> so there was no monasteries or places I could go. So I heard there was a Zen monastery had opened up in the north of England. So I went up there for a weekend retreat. And at that weekend retreat, you know what happens, the first day you're tired. But there was no sleeping in there. You had to get up sometime like four or five o'clock in the morning. And oh my goodness, it was cold. Even for me it was freezing. And so what we had to do, we had to, in this narrow hall, we, <coughs> we sat down on either side of the passageway, facing the wall. So you couldn't see when the teacher came up with a stick. Now everyone was tired at that time in the morning. But I did have some good karma. My good karma was the person sitting next to me was more tired than I was. <laughs> <laughs> so he got hit first. Whack! And as soon as I heard that sound, I was perfectly <laughs> awake. <laughs> I, was, I wasn't tired at all after that. But I got rid of my sloth and torpor just out of fear. I wasn't still or peaceful, I was shaking. <laughs> so that doesn't work. That's not the way to open the lotus. 
That just closes you up even further. So yes, be mindful, but be kind as well. Because without that compassion, there's not the warmth to open up the lotus. So you're kind to your body, which is why I've asked you to sleep a lot the first few days. You're kind to the body, so we try and get you some nice food to eat. You're kind to the body, so we've got all these cushions. And usually find by the end of the retreat, there's more and more cushions <laughs> disappear. <laughs> As you're using more and more. <coughs> because I know that's how the lotus opens up. So you're kind to your body, you're mindful of it, because the two have to go together. As I mentioned, the mindfulness gives you feedback, and your kindness, you know, things are relaxing, the problems are disappearing, there's no thing to worry about anymore, so you can let your body go. The mindfulness and kindness allow you to sit here when the body's not worrying you at all, the body disappears. The body is the outermost petal of the lotus. It sort of opens up and you go into your mental world, or the inside world. Now in the inside world, when you first go beyond your body inside, of course the body is very coarse, the mental world is still a bit coarse. But you've got to go inside that. And the first part of the mental world you go inside is by being kind and being aware you find all your past and future disappears. You're going into the middle of time. That's what we call the present moment. Sometimes the time has, the past and the future, it's this whole long <coughs> length of stuff. You go right into the middle of it. For anyone who's having difficulty getting into present moment awareness, there is a little exercise which I developed for you. And that's the exercise of the two shopping bags. The two shopping bag uh, simile is like you've just been to the shopping mall, you've got your clothes, you've got other stuff, and as you're walking out to the car park you have these two really heavy bags. And because it's such a long way to the car park, the heavy bags are so heavy that your arms start to ache and your shoulders hurt. I'm sure you've all experienced that before. Or maybe when you go to the airport on your way home. You see, you who picked me up from the airport, how much stuff do I carry, even though I'm going overseas? Just usually one little bag. And you guys, you only go for a couple of days somewhere, oh, a big suitcase and another suitcase. And it doesn't matter sort of how big the suitcases are, you still need these straps on the outside to stop them exploding. <laughs> <laughs> That's the heavy suitcases. So you've been there and done that. So this simile works because it's your experience. You've sometimes been carrying very heavy bags and it really hurts the shoulders and the arms. And in this mental exercise, you've got your eyes closed, you imagine yourself carrying these two heavy bags and you imagine that it's actually hurting. And then you look at the bag on the left hand, on the left arm, and you see written on the outside, now not Gucci, you know, not sort of Mont Blanc, <laughs> on the outside you can see the words P-A-S-T, the past. Because that's the bag in which you put all your past, all your memories, both good and bad, and you've got them in this bag called the past and you've been carrying them for such a long time. Not your arms, but your brain hurts. You're tired, you're stressed, you're worried. And then you look at the bag in your right hand and that has got <laughs> written on the outside F-U-T-U-R-E. That comes, that's your future. And in that suitcase or shopping bag you put all your worries <coughs> and fears and anxieties as well as all your hopes and dreams of the future in the bag in your right hand. And that is also so heavy. That hurts your brain too when you're always worried about the future. So, in this mental exercise you associate the imaginary bag in your left hand as the past, the imaginary bag in the right hand as your future, 
the imagine they're so heavy because you've been carrying them around for too long and your mind, your brain, your heart is very tired. And then you imagine yourself leaning to the left so you can lower the bag in your left hand to the floor. Do it slowly. And when it reaches the ground, the weight disappears. But that's not enough. You uncurl your fingers, straighten the back so your left arm is hanging loosely by your side. And in that exercise, you've let go of your past. And then you've still got the other bag, which is very heavy, representing your future. And you imagine yourself leaning to the right so that you can lower the right bag to the ground. And when that reaches the floor, again, there's no more burden. And you move your hand away from the handle, so your right arm is hanging loosely by your side. No pain, re-energizing, relaxing, without any, carrying any burdens. And as you're relaxing, you look down. And there are those two bags. No one is going to take them away, unfortunately. <laughs> They're there for you later on. So you don't have to be worried. You just put them down for the time being so you can rest. <coughs> and as you're resting, you find that you are standing right between those two bags. You're standing in the space between the past and the future. That's called now. That's the place you can relax. And why do you relax? So that afterwards you can pick up your burdens and you can carry them without any pain, without any stress. The reason why we stress out is because we carry things too long. We don't know how to let them go for a while. So that's what you do in this little exercise to go into the centre of time, which is called the present moment. And I tell many meditators, just to get that far is wonderful. You're free from all the, the guilt and the anger of who said what to you. You're free of all these worries and concerns about what's going to happen next. Oh, it's just so wonderful. You're like, your mind is at peace at last. Because all of your problems, not all of them, but 99.9% .9 are all about what's going to happen in the future or what's happened so far in your life. And if you can put those two down, it's amazing how free you feel and how relaxed you can become and how happy you feel. So even this layer of petals called the present moment Remember, you've opened up the body and then you've just got this mental world. You open up the mental world and inside of this is the present moment. You don't go anywhere else. You stay where you are, but you go into it, into the now. And as you are watching this present moment, you know, you'll still have a commentary about this moment. This is happy, this is fun, this is good. What should I do next or anything else? If that word comes up, what should I do next? A little red flag should come up. The alarm bells should ring, ding, ding, ding. What do you mean, next? You've lost the present moment. The job is not what you're doing next, it's what you're doing now. That's the only question you need to ask in meditation. What's happening? So any time that word next comes up, remember, red flag, stop that. Stay in a moment. It also means you've got nothing to do. There is no next. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? You're totally free, no responsibility. You come into the centre of time. But there's always this conversation goes on. That's the next layer of petals. Present moment awareness, but you've still got a conversation. And as I've taught you in the middle of those words, <laughs> there is silence. 
if you go into the center of the present moment, it's silent. That's what's happening. You're going in to the next stage. Present moment is called now. N-O-W. In the center of that word is O, zero, nothing. In the center of that circle is just space. Even a word tells you, go inside of it and it's totally empty. So how do you do this? How do you get into the present moment? How do you get into silence? How do you open up that lotus so far? Mindfulness and kindness. You know, the warmth and the light of the sun. So you're watching this body, you're kind to it, you're mindful of it, after a while it disappears. You get into the mental world, you're kind to it, you let go of things, the future and the past. You're aware of this moment and the time disappears. There is no past, there is no future. It's through mindfulness and kindness you get into the present moment, not through force. If you said, I'm going to be in the present moment, that's the future. It never happens because it's always something you're going to do, not something you are doing. So with mindfulness and kindness, you actually just get into the present moment. And how do you stop the thinking? So stop thinking, and that's another thought, and that's another one too. It's so hard to stop thinking because we try to think to stop thinking. We just don't know how to do it. Just like that old joke of the four monks, they were had a vow of silence and one monk sneezed. And the other, first monk said, bless you. The second monk, you've just broken your vow of silence. The third monk said, so have you. The fourth monk said, I'm glad I'm the only one here who can keep quiet. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see what happens. That when you say something, you've broken it. So it's so hard to stop thinking. But this is what happens. Mindfulness and kindness. You get so soft that thoughts don't come anymore. You've gone into the center of the present moment. In the very center of the present moment, there's no space to say anything. In my book, The um, uh, Basic <coughs> Method of Meditation, I described it like greeting uh, visitors at a party you're hosting. As one visitor comes in the door, if you talk with them, you miss the visitor coming right behind them. You don't have time to say hello and have a conversation, because someone else is coming right behind. That's like the procession of moments in time. If you greet this one happening right now and have a conversation with it, the one coming afterwards you miss. So being right in the center of the present moment, with every moment as it comes, means you haven't got any time to say anything. There's too much happening. You're just silent. You've got into the center of things. So don't force yourself to be silent. Don't complain if you're not silent. Just be kind, really, really kind. Be aware and silence will just come. All this talking, all this conversation will be like the lotus. When the time is right, when there's enough compassion and mindfulness, it just opens up by itself. And there you are, you have silence. What do you do next? Red flag. <laughs> there is no next. Enjoy the silence. Why are you trying to throw away the silence? Just be silent. Isn't that beautiful to be silent in life? So don't aim for anything else. Aim to be more fully silent, just to stay there. Don't go any place. Because if you try and think of something else or go somewhere else, it's like a cloud comes in front of the sun, blocks the heat and the, the light, and the lotus, boom, 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 closes up again. And you've got to start from scratch. So just be in the moment, kindness and mindfulness, that's all you need. You're silent. And after a while, in that silence, what's opening up next 
The body awareness opens up, so you just got your breathing. The breath comes to you. <clears throat> you know, I sometimes wondered why it is that the most famous method of meditation is breath meditation. That's the meditation the Buddha said he used to become enlightened under the Bodhi tree. It was the method which has been most famous in history in Buddhism. Why the breath? <coughs> and after meditating a while, it's just obvious because when the body relaxes and settles down, when nothing else is moving, that's the last thing left you can watch. The arms aren't moving, there's no sound to disturb you, the body is at peace, the one thing which is moving, your breath. So when everything else disappears, that's the last thing which is moving. I mentioned this earlier, this is just the nature of the human brain. It can only notice things which change. The sound of an air conditioner, after a while you can't hear it. The taste of your saliva, now you can be aware of it. A few seconds ago you weren't because it stays the same, as soon it will disappear. When I was in that Zen monastery, uh, where they used that stick, you used to uh, have to meditate facing the wall with your eyes open. It was very weird because after a few minutes, maybe half an hour, 40 minutes, you're watching this wall with your eyes open, wondering what you're supposed to be doing, and the wall disappeared. It vanished, which was very strange. I wasn't taking hallucinogenic drugs, I wasn't crazy, but just the world wasn't there anymore. And of course, at the time I thought that was weird, but now I understand what was going on. Because if you see something and it's not changing, after a while the brain turns off to sense of sight. Because even seeing, if things don't move and change, they disappear. That's just basic way the brain works. So, sitting still, the body's disappearing, sound's disappearing, you've got your eyes closed, sight is disappearing, smell and taste are disappearing, it all vanishes. And the only thing which is moving is your breath. So it's quite natural, even if you don't go looking for the breath, when you settle down, you will become aware of the breath. When I first learned meditation, I was told to look at the breath from the very beginning. And then it's never really fine, it's never beautiful. But now I never go looking for my breath, I just follow this practice, being kind, being mindful, opening the mind up, and then there comes the stage where the, that's all that's left there, just breathing. And that's always very beautiful, very peaceful, very relaxing. Also in breath meditation, some of you may have been taught to watch the breath at the tip of your nose. Please don't do that. Number one, because if you've got hay fever like I have, it means that many days of the year you can't meditate because there's no breath going up my nose. If you have a cold and your sinuses are blocked, you, that's what happened to me, I thought, oh my goodness, because of my bad karma, I can't meditate. I've got a nose block. So I, I would watch the tip of my nose, nothing was going on there, because my breath was going through my mouth. So, but, later on, I realised, no, you don't watch at the tip of your nose, you just watch it, that's all. And because I was fortunate having sinus problems, I think I must have punched an arrow hut in my past life, and that's my karma to have a blocked nose. <laughs> that's only a joke. But, because um, you knew you are always breathing somewhere, you just watch the breath wherever it happened to be. But I've found since that people who keep focusing on the tip of their nose, they get headaches. And it's so common for people to have what they call samadhi headaches, because they're watching the tip of the nose 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes at a time. 
and to show you what's going on, I will remove my glasses. So you can see what's really going on. Usually you meditate on the tip of your nose with your eyes closed. I'm now going to meditate on the tip of my nose with my eyes open. Because have a look at my eyes, this is what happens. <laughs> and if you stay like that for about 20 minutes, you are going to get a headache. <laughs> it's eye strain. Because what the mind looks at, the eyes tend to follow. So please, if you get headache when you're meditating, it's because you're doing this for half an hour. <laughs> it doesn't work. So, <laughs> then you have to look for the breath. Just let the breath come to you. Because that's what happens, you go into silence. In the middle of silence you will find the breath. Just like this is the petals of silence in the lotus. Just be warm, be kind. Be mindful and soon it opens up and you can just see the breath. What do you do next? Red flag, not next, just stay with the breath. And enjoy it because it's peaceful. Already there's no past, no future. It's like you've got no business to do. It's like you really are on holiday. I don't know why some people go on holiday. How much vacation do you get in Singapore? It's really hard to get days off. And what do you do when you go and get days off? You go shopping in Shanghai. <laughs> You've got plenty of stuff in Orchard Road. Why do you go to Shanghai to go shopping? You go and see the Great Wall of China. We've got a wall in front of our monastery, go and see that. It's just bricks the same. You go and see Niagara Falls waterfall. Go in the shower and turn the water on, that's a waterfall. <laughs> and when you go... So many people go on holiday to these stupid places and when you get back, are you rested? No, you're really war tired. <laughs> Jet lag, waiting for aircrafts, going through customs, getting to a hotel and having to check out early the next day. Oh gee, that sucks. So, <laughs> why do you do such things? But if you just come in to have some silence, Wow, that really is a holiday. Just in the present moment, you really are free from all your business. No future, no past. You really do rest. And you really go back refreshed. And people ask you, wow, you look so good, so relaxed. Where did you go for holiday? <laughs> I went to Club Med Serpentine. <laughs> Cloud meditation. <laughs> Otherwise known as Janaka. You really have a good rest here. So just being silent, that's enough. You're having a wonderful time. So be content with the silence, which means you just stay there. And if you really are kind and mindful, you won't stay with the silence. The silence itself will develop into this breath. But the breath will be surrounded by silence. The silence will be surrounded by the present moment. You're just going further in. You have present moment, you have silence, you're just with the breath. And imagine, there's no thoughts of the future or the past, no thoughts at all. It's so easy to stay with the breath. There's nothing disturbing you. There's a breath going in, breath going out. You know, some people, they like to go to the beach. Some go to the beach to see the girls. I used to go to these beaches when no one was. So I could just watch the waves come in and watch the waves come out. It was so peaceful. Just like watching the breath come in and watching the breath go out. It's just so peaceful. But that reminds me of one story. I used to go teaching in a prison to the south of here in Bunbury. And the only way to get down there was to take a train just uh, in the early, well, just late, late uh, morning, had my lunch on the train with some sandwiches. And they could only get into the prison in the evening times, had a free afternoon, every afternoon. And so one day I went down to the beach in Bunbury, it was deserted, there's no one there at all. And just sit on the beach and just watch the waves come in and waves go out. 
and then closed my eyes and went into meditation for about a couple of hours. And when I opened my eyes after meditating for two hours, I was quite alarmed. I was very disturbed because I could sense there was somebody sitting next to me on either side. And then when I looked down, left my left, there was this 17 year old, what you would call hot chick in a bikini <laughs> with flowing blonde hair. And on my right was a brunette, equally gorgeous. There were two bikini clad, clad 17 year olds sitting on either side of me <laughs> by the beach. <laughs> if, if someone had had a camera, I would have been in big trouble. <laughs> it, wasn't my, I, it wasn't my fault. What had happened? They explained to me afterwards was I was just meditating there, perfectly still. I wasn't hearing any sounds or anything. And it was the last examination of what they call in Australia Year 12, the, the university entrance exam. And the high school was just maybe you know, half a kilometre away. And they just finished their last exam. School was over. It was either university or get a job somewhere. And of course, as soon as it was over, they all got into their bathers and they went to the beach to celebrate. I didn't know that, but two of the girls, they're in their bikinis and they saw this monk on the beach. And they just, they, they were really interested. They wanted to know what I was doing while I was sitting so still and wanted to ask questions about Buddhism. So they just sat on either side of me, just waiting. <laughs> And that was actually the truth. They asked some questions on Buddhism and I got out as quick as I could. <laughs> but if anyone had photographed me, I would have been so embarrassed. It would be hard to explain what happens. <laughs> it's just like the, another story of one of the monks. You know, it's very difficult being a monk. You know, you're very innocent, you know, you're, you're trying to do the right thing, but you get yourself in trouble now and again. You know, for no bad intentions, one of our monks, he was travelling from Adelaide back to Perth on the aircraft and he happened to be sitting next to a guy who was, um, had anxiety disorder with flying. He had to fly but he was so afraid the only way he could cope was having as much free drinks from the aircraft as he could. So he's already on his maybe ninth or tenth glass of whiskey you know, when the plane hit turbulence. And have a guess where that whiskey went. <laughs> <laughs> it went all over the monk's robe just before he landed. So when he came out from the airport, when we were meeting him, <laughs> he felt like he'd been in the pub all night. <laughs> he said, no, 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 I never drank anything. Somebody just spilt whiskey over me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, so that's sometimes what happens. But anyway, back to the silence and the, the, um, the breath. The breath just appears quite naturally when you just let go of things. And sometimes say, well, what happens next? You just stay with the breath. Now because you're not doing anything, you're just staying with something very peaceful, just like watching the waves on the ocean, you get very happy. The happiness of contentment, the happiness of stillness. And this petal called the breath opens up to what I call the delightful, the beautiful breath. It just happens by itself. You don't go looking for it, you stay with the ordinary breath with kindness and mindfulness and it becomes delightful. And the delightful breath experience, you're just sitting here and watching the breath go in, oh so nice. Breath go out, oh yeah, I can do this all day. And you can. This is where I always like to call this a pivot point in meditation. Once you get that delightful breath, you can sit for hours and you're really one happy little meditator. And when I get people to get that stage, I'm very happy too because you understand what meditation is. Just sitting here, just, just watching your breath go in, watching your breath go out, so happy, so beautiful, so delighted. In Pali it means you're getting piti sukha coming up, the joy and happiness. If you think, I invent this method, 
No, this is Anapanasati Sutta, stages five and six. Breathing in, you experience pity, out pity, breathing in, sukha, breathing out, sukha. That's exactly how the Buddha taught. The layer of petals opens up, the ordinary breath, and it's a very, very beautiful layer of petals, really fragrant. You know when you, you have a flower and you really smell it and it's just really delicious, very, very delightful. That's where you are now in the meditation, the delightful breath. And how did you get there? You didn't want to get anywhere, you just stayed where you were, with kindness and mindfulness and allowing yourself to open up like the lotus. And now you're really getting into some nice stuff. If you get the delightful breath, you'll be a meditator, you'll come back again, you'll meditate at home. Why? Because it's fun to do. I was taught, because I was brought up in a Christian country, that religion is something you have to endure, some penance you have to do. Sitting on the, the in the church I used to go to, there was no cushions, it was like hard wood. And this was in England, they were cold, there was no heaters, they were all stone. And everything was just so ascetic and austere. Even the preacher would keep on telling you how bad you were all the time. <laughs> never would they tell a joke, never ever would they tell a funny story. It was just so devoid of happiness. And that's why many people thought that religion should be severe. Even today in some countries people think that monks shouldn't laugh. That monks should be fierce. They're the real monks. <laughs> But I don't care what they should be, this is how they are, and this is what works. And when you get delight in the meditation, you can't help but smile. Which is why in the Dhammacetya Sutta, Matamunikaya, sometimes I have to quote the sutras, the word of the Buddha, just to give authority to what I'm saying. When King Prasenadi told the Buddha how much he enjoyed going to the Jetavana monastery, the Jeta Grove Monastery, where the Buddha spent most, more time than any other monastery. The Buddha asked him, why do you enjoy coming to this monastery? And the king replied, because in this monastery the monks are always smiling and happy. And the Buddha replied, yes, great king, that's what you can expect when people meditate correctly. They're smiling and happy. I love quoting that. Because I know that if you're meditating correctly, if you're smiling and happy, <laughs> if you're miserable, sorry, you've not understood it yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> smile for goodness sake and make me happy. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what happens, the breath is delightful. And even at that stage you will find yourself, even breakfast time, seven o'clock, sitting here, and you know it's breakfast, you hear the gong, you say, no, I'm staying meditating. The breath is more delightful than breakfast, which for a Singaporean, that is quite something. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> you're sitting here just watching the breath, you miss breakfast. It always happens in, in my retreats, there's usually somebody, one or two people miss breakfast or miss lunch, they're sitting here just as happy as anything. That's the beginning of happiness. So, this delightful breath, these beautiful petals of a lotus, so fragrant. You just stay there, don't do anything, and then they open up. Now what's inside those? Beautiful lights called the nimittas. These are inside the delightful breath. So you don't think, I've been on the delightful breath long enough, now I'm going to push that away and go on to the nimittas. Mm. You don't do that, you stay where you are. The lotus is opening up and you can't get hold of the leaves or the petals and pull them apart. You'll destroy them. It has to be natural. So you just carry on with kindness, with the warmth of kindness and mindfulness on the delightful breath, which is very easy to do. <laughs> you can't not do it, it's just too delightful. And after a while that opens out. You see these beautiful lights in the mind. Those were called the nimittas. And now I have your full attention because you really, really, really want those nimittas. <laughs> 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 
And the reason there lights in the mind is because that outermost, that petal called the delightful breath, that's the last part of the five senses. Now they've gone. And you're just left with that sixth sense of the mind. This is the first time the thing we call the mind in part of the chitta manifests. You can actually see it now. What is this thing called the mind? This beautiful light which comes up. And for those of you who think, I will never see a nimitta, I guarantee each one of you will see a nimitta. If not before, when you die. <laughs> <laughs> you go towards the light. That light you see at death is the nimitta. Same thing. Your body is dead. Five senses have stopped. That's why you see this nimitta, this light. Same thing. But you know, it's much better to see it while you're alive because you have more fun. <laughs> and <coughs> so the petals just open up, you see this beautiful light, this nimitta. You know that so many of my students, they're really good up to that point. And as soon as the nimitta comes up, all the instructions go out of the window and they start saying, yeah, excited, woohoo! <laughs> or I'm going to grab it, what should I do with it next? Please remember, just be kind, be mindful. Don't change the process. Because if you do, that nimitta vanishes. And so often it's the case, people get their first nimitta, whoosh, beautiful, and it's gone in a second. Oh, what did you do that for? You were doing everything right, and instead of allowing that nimitta to stay, you got involved and interfered. Just carry on making peace, being kind, being gentle, being mindful and kind. And then that nimitta, when it's ready, it will just settle down. With nimitta, so often people see it at the corner, first of all, as if it's just you know, checking you out. What to do? Don't go bringing it down, or don't try moving your head, because it moves over there with you. <laughs> <laughs> just carry on being kind, being gentle, and it will come to you. Remember, all these things come to you when you're ready. You don't go to them. And that's all you do, just carry on being kind, being mindful, and soon it will centre. Sometimes it moves around all over the place, just let it move around. You just be mindful, be kind. There you are, Nimitta. Settle down. Shh. That's just being kind. And then it stays with you. The petal has opened up for you. You've got this incredible, delightful, beautiful inner petal called a Nimitta. And that, that will be worth flying all over the world to get one of those Nimittas. Incredibly beautiful. Spiritually very profound. There you really get to understand how powerful this Buddhism is. But of course, there are many more perils to come. <laughs> That's okay. There's many more perils to come yet. Because you're with this beautiful nimitta. And it's so easy to stay with it because it's very, very, very nice. And sooner or later that beautiful light incredibly beautiful, full of energy, full of power, opens up. So often people experience themselves falling into that nimitta, or the nimitta just embracing them, and they go to a totally different space. They're going inside, inside the nimitta, and the nimitta is inside the um, Nimitta is inside the delightful breath. The delightful breath is inside the ordinary breath. The ordinary breath is inside the silence. The silence is inside the, um, the present moment. And the present moment is inside your body. And your body is inside this moment right now. That's where it is. So this is where it all starts from. So when you go inside the Nimitta, those are called the jhanas. And some, these are incredibly powerful states. This is the beautiful petals right inside of you, 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 right now. 
So in one sense you have the jhanas, they're there. You just got to open out the outermost petals to see what's inside of this moment. And there you find them. Many times people ask, now what should you do once you're in first jhana? How can you go from first jhana to second jhana? Remember the second jhana is right inside the first. Just stay. And soon the first jhana opens up and you're inside of it, in the second jhana. And the third jhana is inside the second, fourth inside the third. And the, these immaterial states, they're one inside the other until the last immaterial state, neither perception or non-perception. These are petals which are hardly any thickness at all, like gossamer thin. So incredibly delightful beyond this world, when that last one opens up. There, you have the jewel in the heart of the lotus. You know what that jewel is? I'm not telling you. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to find out for yourself, for goodness sake. <laughs> but this is how you open up the lotus. So, you don't do anything. Your job is just to maintain your kindness, maintain your mindfulness, and that way, you will find that the mind and the body opens up. I've taught you today about the stages of meditation. But I, I didn't want to talk about these stages of meditation in the very beginning. Present moment awareness, silence, watching the breath, delightful breath, you know, nimittas and jhanas and stuff. Because if I hadn't couched that and framed that in the, in the lotus simile, you'd have tried to attain those things. You'd have gone around to your friend, what stage are you at? <laughs> and you say, I'm delightful breath. Ah, oh, delightful breath, I got that the first day. <laughs> I'm right there. <laughs> as soon as you have stages, you've got attainments and pride and comparing, each other, comparing yourself with each other and some of you feel really hopeless. You haven't even got to, to present moment awareness yet. <laughs> No, that's not the point. It's a process. How you meditate the, rather than what you're experiencing. Please always remember that. Be mindful, be kind. Continue on that path and it has to happen. Everything will have to open up. And that's what experience is like. You always go deeper into things. You never ever go on to the next stage. You go in and in, and in, to the next stage. That's how it works. The simile of the thousand petal lotus. And it will happen to you sooner or later.